Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my, my task is to fill in some detail on how liver disease affects men, and you've already heard quite a bit about alcohol and obesity as it affects the liver, but I'm going to fill you in with more, more detail. Uh, this is where my institute is in UCL. I also work at the London Clinic, and just for the chairman's benefit, it takes 20 minutes of fast walking to get between the two places. So if you do it twice or two or three times a day, I do get my exercise requirement. And uh, I'm not going to talk much about women, but I, I'm surprised to see how many women are here in the audience. Uh, they're obviously greatly concerned about men, but I suppose women always are interested in men. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, proceed. These are the main liver diseases affecting men in the UK. Alcoholic liver disease, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the detail of that. Clearly related to rising alcohol consumption in the country. It's much cheaper, it's more affordable by the general population. These are all government measures which have led to a great increase in the drinks industry's profits at the expense of the health of the nation. Access, you know, to the supermarkets, very easy. It's not difficult to understand why alcohol consumption has gone up so dramatically in the country over the past 10 years. And as a result of that, there's more alcoholic liver disease. Hepatitis B and C related to sex, because it's transmitted sexually, with it, along with HIV, intravenous drug use, again, increase in figures in the country. Very important in the context of hepatitis B and C is immigration, large numbers coming into the country, I'm going to touch on that, and world travel, because people travel across the world from areas where these hepatitis viruses are very high in incidence and into places like the UK, where they used to be low in prevalence. Primary hepatitis cellular carcinoma, where as hepatologists seeing more and more of it's an important cause of death. Some countries in the world, it's the third commonest cause of death, very frequent cause of death from cancer. It occurs in all types of cirrhosis, once end-stage liver disease has developed. The highest frequency is seen in those patients that have developed cirrhosis from hepatitis B infection, and there's a particular genetic disorder, a common uh, genetic disorder, although in clinical practice not so common, hemochromatosis, iron overload disease, where there's a very high instance of hepatocellular carcinoma, even if those patients are properly treated early on by multiple venesection therapy. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, already been touched on, component of the metabolic syndrome, and it's related to rising levels of obesity in the UK. We're catching up with America. You've already heard quite a lot about obesity and the harm that it does. It harms the liver because it uh, will produce cirrhosis in some patients. This slide uh, Roger Kirby used, it, it's, it just it, to me, give, give the, gives you the whole story of this uh, alcoholic liver disease in the UK. It is not matched by any other country in the world. We are the leading country in terms of the rate of increase in alcoholic liver disease. And this is the prevalence of deaths under 65. So these are people who are dying often in the prime of their life, and it goes back to figures from 1970 up to 2006. You could put in on the slide the rising alcohol consumption in the country expressed per capita, that's per person, and the two exactly match. There is some plateauing of this rise now in the last few years. The government will say it's because of all their voluntary agreements with industry but as you must know, 
they really have little effect. This is the drinking behavior in the country. Hazardous, when you drink more than safe limits, that's more than 20 units, uh, 21 units a week, and a glass of wine just to uh, drive it home. Uh, uh, the large glass of wine that you get fed so often is three units, so you've only got to have two of those and you're six units a day, and you multiply that by seven, that's 42 <coughs> units in a week. The upper limit of safe drinking for a man is 21 units, lower for women. So between 21 and 50 units a week is called hazardous drinking. This is a, an accepted classification. They're putting themselves at hazard of developing disease. 31% of men in this country are drinking at hazardous levels. Harmful, where we have direct evidence of harm resulting, 9% less in women. That's more than 50 units a week women more than 35 units a week. Dependency, where the man or woman becomes dependent on alcohol. They can't survive or they get symptoms of withdrawal when they stop drinking nearly 10% of the population. So these are staggering numbers of people who are exposing themselves either hazard, to hazards of drinking or actually the harmful effects or to becoming dependent so they can't <coughs> escape from it. This uh, slide shows you the patterns of alcoholic liver disease as we see them. The commonest is fatty liver. And actually, in the early stages of alcohol-induced liver disease, you can't distinguish the fatty liver which developed from the fatty liver that develops when you're obese. And what we know is, and it used to be the common pattern, is that the alcoholic would have a fatty liver over many years and would slowly progress to a cirrhosis, perhaps after 20 or 30 years, heavy drinking, and at that stage they would present with either compensated liver disease or decompensated when, as a result of portal hypertension, they have an esophageal bleed, or they develop a encephalopathy or ascites. And of course, it's the long natural history of developing cirrhosis that makes it difficult to, for patients to accept that they're doing themselves harm because over these years they are feeling pretty well, but they're certainly not feeling well once they get cirrhosis. And from cirrhosis, the final event is the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. The type of disease, however, that we're seeing now in the population with the higher levels of alcohol consumption is increasingly what we term alcoholic hepatitis. And this is a much more acute illness that can develop after a relatively small number of years, few number of years of heavy drinking, in which there's very severe hepatic inflammation, which can go on to acute liver failure. It is a hepatitis, just like viral hepatitis in many ways, an acute, inflammatory, destructive process going on in the liver as a result of the toxicity of the alcohol being ingested. This was a, a boy, a young man, 21 years at I, uh, as well as my colleagues, looked after in UCLH, uh, I think two years ago now. He had been drinking since the age of 13. And we all know from the media how much alcohol is shifting down the age range, and many young people, even at school, are drinking heavily because they have access and they have pocket money. It all, all makes it possible. So he'd been drinking since the age of 13. Um, in recent years, it had been up to 60 units a day. Very heavy drinker. And then in May, he presented to a local hospital having been perfectly well. And these young people are perfectly well. They may even be doing quite well at sports, but then suddenly they get ill. Two weeks illness, jaundice, 
feeling unwell, fever, all the signs of an acute hepatitis, acute illness. He was treated in the local hospital in the standard way, nutritional support. These are measures, terlipressin and albumin infusion to try and improve liver function, antibiotics. He had a trial of steroids, which again in some patients can improve the condition by turning off the inflammatory response. He was transferred to UCLH. We confirmed the diagnosis. He was put in the ITU. He had two separate ways of treatment by liver support devices. One is known as MARS, or it's not the planet, it's molecular adsorbent recycling system. You absorb toxins from the body in a recirculating extracorporeal circuit. The ELAD extracorporeal liver assist device actually has components of functioning hepatocytes to give extra function as well as remove toxins. And with those treatments, with the intensive care that he had, his condition was maintained, but with a bilirubin of over 400, encephalopathy grades one to two. And at that stage, the only possible option for him was a liver transplant, and his case was referred to the UK Liver Transplant Advisory Group when, uh, sadly to say, they did not accept that he should have a transplant, and he died shortly afterwards. It's been mentioned already that you need to pick up people who are harming themselves early at the stage where they, it may not be apparent to them that they are harming themselves. You've had liver blood tests, liver function tests, the serum transaminases being mentioned. So the SGOT, AST, the MCV, mean combust maximum combustible volume, they will identify misuse, that is heavy, hazardous drinking, in about two-thirds of people in hospital who are known to be drink who are found to be drinking heavily. So it's only two-thirds, and those are people who are already in hospital for various reasons. In primary care, <laughs> they will detect only about 25% of those who are drinking hazardously or harmfully. And there's a great, uh, obviously a great concern about how you pick up people who are in the early stages of liver damage and, and are harming themselves without realizing it. And it, it is of interest that there are various questionnaires. This is so-called audit, alcohol use, Disorders Identification Test, a self-administered 10 questions on consumption of the patient, what they're drinking, their behavior, whether they uh, binge drink, when do they drink at weekends, do they get into violence and so on, and are they dependent on it. <coughs> and what's been shown in a good number of surveys now is that this simple self-administered questionnaire which can be used in the A&E department, can be used in primary care, will pick up a very high percentage of those who are drinking excessively and are at risk from a, a, a disease resulting from it. So this is the way of trying to pick up the early cases. And it's also been shown that when you do this test, there's at least 20% of the people who are, take part in it will cut down their alcohol consumption or even decrease uh, drinking habits. The so-called single intervention, the single intervention done by a, G, uh, a GP, a nurse, or a hospital consultant based on this sort of approach can be very beneficial overall in getting people to understand what is happening as a result of their excessive drinking. So I've done the first big uh, cause, alcohol, and I'm now going to move on to hepatitis B and hepatitis C. This slide gives you de details of the number of people that are coming into the country each year, and these were health protection agency figures, official figures, from areas where hepatitis B is high in prevalence. 
seven, eight, nine percent of the population of infected, Africa, Far East, and so on. And they're coming into the country, and this leads to over 6,000 new chronic HBV carriers each year in the country. And it's been shown that the number of chronic carriers in the UK has doubled in the past five years from just under 200,000 uh, 200, to 400,000. And the chronic carriers, of course, will spread infection around the body because there's no testing of them when they come in. They may not even know that they are infected. And, of course, this is the data with respect to AIDS. Many of the new cases of AIDS infection uh, are as a result of immigrants coming in with the AIDS virus into the country. There are some advances, and I shouldn't be just talking of all the gloom. There are advances in our knowledge of how to treat these patients, and this is hepatitis B, active viral replication, ongoing disease, two drugs now, and Tecovir and Tenofovir, which are uh, available in the NHS and have been available uh, for the last two or three years, highly effective in controlling uh, viral replication. This is the test that you do measure the HPV DNA level, and at one year after the start of treatment with tenofovir, 80% of the patients had lost the active replicating virus from the bloodstream. You never, though, get rid of hepatitis B completely. It remains in the nucleus, the genome of the cells throughout the body, and uh, that's why hepatocellular carcinoma can still develop even when you've had effective treatment. But the, it is an advance that we have these two uh, very effective agents. And this perhaps is uh, even more exciting because this is uh, what is happening now with hepatitis C. I haven't got hepatitis C in the title, but it's important that this is hepatitis C, where again, all the figures show a rising number of patients with hepatitis C in the country from immigration, but also a very big background level of infection. This was a standard treatment with pegylated interferon and ribavirin given for 48 weeks, you got a sustained virological response, this term, that is, when you stop treatment, the virus is completely cleared, and for hepatitis C, unlike hepatitis B, you are completely cleared. The virus has then disappeared, being completely uh, removed from the body. And these are the results of treatment about 45% of those treated for the first time got a response. And if they didn't get a response and you treated them again, so-called relapsers or non-responders, there was a lower percentage that responded to the second course of treatment. Pegylate interferon ribavirin, pretty unpleasant treatment. Any, any of you who've treated patients with chronic HCV infection with these agents know well, know how the patient complains, the shivers, the shakes of interferon, they lose weight, all sorts of very unpleasant side effects, but nevertheless, they can get a cure. But with these two new drugs, Teleprevir and Bisetprevir, they're given as triple therapy. They've just been released into the UK, but not yet considered by NICE, although in Scotland, they have been made available uh, for cases of uh, relapses and non-responders. What NICE would do, heavens knows. Nobody is here from NICE, otherwise I'd be getting at them. But these are the better figures, up to 60% complete virological response. And those who have to have, who had previously failed treatment, relapses, non-responders, a remarkable clearance is up to 70%, and with Bocetprevir, 75% of people who failed a standard course of treatment now with triple therapy can get a clearance of the virus. So this 
This is setting the whole of the hepatology uh, world uh, uh, alight with excitement because for the first time we're able to get very high response rates with these drugs. But they're toxic. They require a lot of management expertise in their use. Moving on to hepatocellular carcinoma, I just put in one slide on this, although it's an increasing uh, problem, particularly in hospital care and in diagnosis of it at an early stage. Historical survival used to be six months. Terrible disease. As soon as anybody made a diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, it was considered to be a death warrant. But now, with treatment, and again, I'm now on the hopeful uh, um, scenario, you can get 40 to 50% four-year survival. But you have to diagnose the treatment, the, the, the tumours, at an early stage. And you diagnose that by regular ultrasound examination, six to, or 12 monthly high-quality CT MRI to back up the ultrasound findings. So with good diagnosis, early diagnosis, when the tumour is about three centimetres in diameter, no clinical symptoms, this is preventive disease, ablation techniques, radiofrequency ablation, transarterial chemoembolization will give you up to a 50% four-year survival. And there are new drugs, new agents, not chemotherapy, a drug called serafinib, which is for the first time a drug is being shown to improve uh, survival outcomes. But the use of serafinib is it's a toxic agent, requires expertise, and this requires a considerable investment in hospital facilities, the arrangements of clinics, the follow-up of cirrhotic patients. Non-alcoholic fatty disease come to my fourth category. I've put in here what happens with the development of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The steatosis that is present in 75% of obese subjects. 75% of obese subjects will have a fatty liver, and in the early stages, it's very similar to the fatty disease of alcohol. And of course, obese patients may, as part of their calorie intake, be drinking heavily. So it's not, it's not truly non-alcoholic. It may be a combination of non-alcoholic, so-called fatty liver disease, and alcoholic inducing the fatty liver. About 10% will go from steatosis to a steatohepatitis. That's when inflammation, damage to the liver cells, comes in just like the alcoholic hepatitis. It's an inflammatory reaction damaging the liver cells. And from that, about 15% will go on to cirrhosis, and 5% of those who develop cirrhosis will go on to hepatocellular carcinoma. So it's not very different, this pattern of disease from alcohol, in that you need to diagnose it at this stage. And this is where recording the patient's weight, having ultrasound examination, looking at their blood, uh, blood tests, again going into their history will enable you to diagnose it early. <coughs> this is a clinical impact that has already been touched on. Transaminase elevation is the commonest cause of liver referral to our patients now. They have diabetes, hypertension, lipidemia as part of the metabolic syndrome. <coughs> and they have an increased mortality quite apart from liver disease related to cardiovascular events and cancers. And cancers can develop in a fatty liver, primary hepatic cancer develop in a fatty liver without there being liver damage, simply as a consequence of the fatty deposition. Now, my last two slides are in a rather different vein. I wanted to stress Again, some of the advances that can be achieved in treating the very sick patient with liver disease 
who gets admitted to the hospital. But this is only obtained in centres where there's expertise, and I'm referring to my old unit's data at King's. These are a comparison of two periods of time. Survival of patients with decompensated liver disease, that's those admitted with liver failure, varices, bleeding, cephalopathy, and so on. Improvement in overall survival, 34% to 46% over those, that second three-year period. So you can get better survival figures, but it requires expertise. These other figures simply are measures of the severity of the liver disease, and, and they're on the slide to show that there's no difference in the severity of the cases being compared over those two periods of time. But when I tell you that this type of expert care is available in very few centres around the UK, that most patients with alcoholic hepatitis or cirrhosis die in the general ward looked after by general physicians around the country, you'll understand what, what is needed if the care of men or women with end-stage liver disease is improved to get better survival figures. And this is my last slide. I just put it in to give you the present position with respect to number of transplants being done in the country. This figure has plateaued because of the shortage of organ donation, organ donors. Alcoholic cirrhosis, the commonest by far, HCV-related cirrhosis, second commonest. These other conditions, autoimmune liver disease, acute liver failure, much lower down in numbers. And in America and in throughout Europe, again, these two common causes, alcohol, hepatitis C, and in the Far East, it's hepatitis B cirrhosis that is predominantly the cause of the end-stage liver disease coming to transplants. But again, there are only six transplant centres in the UK compared with, with the population. That's a very low provision of expert care. And so I finish on that note that if, if lifestyle changes can't be achieved to the extent that they need, then they're also, or, or along with that, there needs to be improvement in the uh, expertise and level of care that's afforded to liver disease patients. Thank you.